So let's uh, let's go ahead and jump into our speaker, which is which is Jim Beach, and uh, Jim is a member of the club. You've been a member of the club for a long, long time, right, Jim? About ten years, yeah. About ten years, yeah. So a long time member. So Jim is going to talk about this is going to be Honeybee 101 for beginners, touching on many issues that the books ignore. So there's your lead in, Jim. So take it away. <laughs> I have to blame Jerry for this talk um, because uh, uh, he asked me what what an April topic might be, and I said, well, maybe a maybe one targeted for beginners. And he said, Jim, he said, you might like to do that. And I said, I might. So anyway, so uh, this talk is definitely for beginners. Um, so many of you will know everything that I'm going to say and maybe more. Um, but here, here goes. I've got bees. Now what? So I sent out a poll. Um, and uh, uh, the, the result of the poll, I mean, I, I was curious about what other people thought might be uh, uh, a beginner thing that they would have liked to have known. And I'm quoting one from Leslie Louie, but it was, there was a whole series of responses were like this. And uh, I'll read it. I, I wish I had known what to look for and how to do some basic hive management practices. I too lost my bees the first year and wanted to go at it again with more knowledge. So like Jim, this, this is Jim is me. That's why I joined the ACBA and like Leslie, I lost my bees the first year. Um, there's a lot more to keeping bees than having a few bee having friends I talked to led me to believe. But I also, I'm gonna make another quote here. Uh, bees are magical and, and one should only keep bees if uh, one loves them for their own sake. And that's Catherine Edwards. She's the ex-president of the club. Um, but I'm gonna oh, sort of, good. yeah, I'm, I'm gonna uh, not really talk about this quotes, even though a lot of people did say that. Uh, I'll be more hands-on. And I also will encourage people to ask questions at any time. Um, so please do that. And I'm going to put my acknowledgements up front um, because uh, many thanks to the club members who made suggestions. And in particular, Ronnie, uh, Jennifer Radke, who's not here, Phil, uh, Catherine Edwards, also not, not here today, and Sue and Jerry. And uh, if you get questions I can't answer, I may dob one of those in or ask one of those people to uh, answer, but if anybody would like to answer, that's okay too. So uh, I, I'm going to first of all put up a calendar, and the calendar is um, what you will see this year. So April, that's now. Uh, and uh, uh, I personally have never fed my bees, but but Jennifer Radke, who does quite a lot of classes at um, the Biofuel Oasis and, and teaches a lot of people, and they supply a lot of bees to new beekeepers, she says that feeding them to get established is a good idea. Uh, and part of that is because uh, they will grow more quickly and they'll be more ant resistant. I'll talk about ants later. Um, the you will have a small hive because uh, uh, if you've got a nuke uh, or probably a swarm and lots of flowers right now so your bees are going to be calm and my recommendation and this is just my recommendation like um, Jim Garcia said if you ask five beekeepers you'll get ten opinions um, inspect often and consider not using gloves and minimal smoke. Smoke will disrupt your bees, um, but they, of course, it has the nice benefit that uh, it uh, makes them less likely to sting you. Uh, but not using gloves, the reason for not using gloves is you, you will get stung sometimes, 
but you'll learn to handle beads a lot less roughly. Um, and uh, uh, I actually very rarely get stung on my hands. So I don't use gloves normally. Um, this is probably not good advice if you're in Florida and had Africanized bees, but up here we've got calm bees. So take some classes, read up on bees, ask lots of questions. Get an EpiPen for a bee sting emergency. There's, I actually had several people give that, that advice. And uh, if you talk to your um, health insurance, uh, several people, and this just happened to me, I found this out as well. Uh, for a $20 copay, you can get an EpiPen. They just say you're a beekeeper and you want an EpiPen uh, because uh, uh, you're afraid that, you know, someone could be stung. Um, and of course, the odds of being stung are much higher because you have bees in your backyard. Summer. So in summer, your, your hive has grown and uh, you should learn about splitting. Um, two hives are more than twice as good as one. And why do I say that? Uh, I personally have managed to kill a lot of hives in, in the early years, especially. Um, you're inspecting, you don't quite know what you're doing and you end up crushing your queen. You, and then you, you look again a week or two later and you've got no queen, or maybe you've just got no queen. So if you have two hives and you're, you went queenless and they are not emerge, and for some reason the emergency queen is failing, you can take frame of young larvae and eggs from the second hive and put it in the first hive. You also just see that the hives are different. So um, learn about mite management. And I'm not gonna talk about mite management in this uh, uh, talk at all, but it's a very, very important part of what you need to learn. Um, and you can probably use it in the fall. And uh, I would say practice mite monitoring, learn how to monitor mites and practice it. So in the late summer, uh, um, in the fall, in the Bay Area, we have uh, weather that is not like the rest of the country. Uh, and most of the beekeeping books are written for the rest of the country, not the Bay Area or California. And uh, what we have is a dearth of flowers um, and it becomes robbing season. So one of the biggest predator on a beehive is another beehive. And uh, if the bees can't defend themselves, um, a neighboring hive will come in and kill that. They'll, in the process of robbing them out, they'll kill that hive. And they rob, they rob it for the honey. And your bees get meaner. They, they become defensive. Um, and so the practice in inspection that you had earlier in the year will come in handy. Um, Inspect for mites and take action, or at least know what's going on. Maybe you can take some honey. Um, depends on how well your hives did. Um, and then winter. In winter, uh, I, my recommendation is that you inspect on the warmer and calm days, but not very, not too often. Here in the Bay Area, uh, your bees will fly all winter. Um, this is not like Minnesota or, or much of the rest of the country where you get snow. Um, and if you, get, if you have healthy bees in winter, that means you'll likely get lots of honey next spring. So that's, and that's one of the reasons people keep bees. So that's the calendar. I have some immediate I have a question, tips. Jim. Yeah, Sorry please. to interrupt. Uh, you no, said about uh, possibly taking honey and not. I think that last year I left too much honey in the hive. And I think that's one of the reasons there was so much robbing. It was such a great target. Do you think that's an issue? I don't know. Um, I think, in my opinion, it would be driven by having the hive be weak. It doesn't have enough members to defend it. Um, would, does one of the other panel members want to weigh in? Uh, 
I would agree with, uh, with you, Jim. Weak hives are more vulnerable. So I think that, you know, it does, I mean, I've, what I see is that small hives like nukes that are, that are weak and they can't defend themselves, they actually don't have that much honey in them, but they'll be robbed out in a, you know, if the bees can figure it out. Wide open entrances makes them vulnerable to robbing, especially if they're yeah. weak. I'll, I'll talk about robbing screens a little bit later, um, but that's a, a great device for deterring robbing. Um, and uh, robbing screens are also a public good because uh, often hive is collapsing, maybe because of disease. And so when the robbers come in, in a dense urban environment where we are, where there's dense by dense, I mean, it's got lots of bees lots of hives, uh, it becomes much easier to transmit disease from that hive to another hive. And so if you put up robbing screens, it has a double purpose. Uh, it prevents robbing uh, of your hive, but it also means that other hives won't get sick. Uh, so immediate tips, placement. So put your bees in the sun if you can, don't put them in the shade. And put them someplace where the flight paths away from people. Uh, management. So in the weak hives, the other predator, big predator here on bees, other than other bees, are ants in the Bay Area. The Argentine ants, they're, they're these mega colonies, these super colonies. Um, which stretch all the way from San Diego to north of San Francisco. Um, and they're the little black ants that you see, and they will attempt to attack that hive. And in a strong colony, the strong, the bees have no problem in keeping them out. But if the, if the colony is weak, ants, ants become a problem. Uh, you may want to feed and of course inspection. I'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, later. And then there's equipment, hives. I'll talk all about all of this. Hives, frames, hive stands, inspection equipment. And, uh, uh, and the recommendation, do get an EpiPen. Um, you have someone visiting and they're allergic. I know, I know two people who have been killed, died from these things. Um, not beekeepers. So here, here's a pick. This is my backyard. A lot of these pictures are in my backyard. And this is a hive that's placed in a non-ideal spot. Um, the tree is to the south. Um, it's quite a big tree, the avocado. And there's a, a shed, the next door neighbor, immediately to the east. And this hive is shaded basically all winter. Um, and uh, at this time of year, it's okay but in the winter, this hive will never see any sun and uh, your bees will not enjoy it. It's not in a flight path though. The feeding. So this is my setup. Um, and so uh, do feed your bees. Uh, this is a tip from uh, Jennifer Radke. Don't do it with a front feeder because it can encourage robbing. If, the, if other bees figure out that there's ready uh, food, sugar water, uh, accessible, they may graduate from trying to poach the sugar water at the entrance to actually robbing the, robbing the whole hive out. Um, and uh, uh, so what I, what I have here is a picture of an uh, inner lid. This is my setup. So there's the inner top. And it's got a little hole in it. You can see the hole right there. It's typical. A lot of the inner lids have that. And then I put a couple of, uh, I just put a couple of spaces so the bees can come up. And then I put this inverted mason jar, which is full of sugar water, right on top with a spare super around it. And the top goes over that. That prevents, uh, that prevents uh, any robbing. Um, and then the bees will just come up and, and, and I've punched these little holes right here. It's just with a nail, you just punch through the lid just enough to make a little spot. Um, and that's 
that's my feeding arrangement. But there are many other feeding arrangements. Um, the one thing to note is, don't, is, is you want to keep it sort of hidden so that uh, other, bee, other beehives won't be attracted. So ants. Well, Argentine ants. And uh, one thing about new hives, so one thing that bees do is that they will um, collect this stuff called propolis, which is a sticky plant rosin. And uh, uh, they will coat the inside of the hive with propolis, but in particular, they'll seal the cracks. They'll just fill cracks or small spaces with propolis. And uh, new hives, they haven't sealed any of these cracks. So the ants have easier access. Um, you can see here that in this arrangement, um, these, this is actually a moat down here. And then above it, there's a, a cap that's been placed to protect the moat from water getting in it. But typically people will put oil or grease in there. Another option is to have legs, but put tanglefoot on the legs. Um, I don't think ant repellents work. I mean, people try diatomaceous earth and other kinds of repellents, but I, outside they just don't work. Uh, at least I haven't heard of any. Uh, I know that ant baits can work. Uh, Jerry uh, controlled the ants in his back in his hive using ant baits, but I personally prefer the moats because it's a non-toxic method of uh, dealing with it. So here's my, my personal anti-ant setup. So I got these moats, these little plastic moats um, from uh, this guy in Los Angeles, Speha. And I've got some mineral oil and I've got an oil dispenser and I just put the mineral oil inside these moats and then occasionally we'll top it up. Um, you can't use water because it'll evaporate out and then the ants will come back. And, and personally, I've only used moats for weak hives. I've never had any ant problems with strong hives. So here's another uh, sort of uh, uh, slide. Uh, robbers, we talked a little bit about robbing and here's some pictures of robbing screens. So this is a nuke, uh, this is a, a 10 frame Langstroth right there. And uh, uh, the construction of this is very simple. There's these two slats and I, I actually cut these to fit. Uh, so I cut it so that it will fit exactly between the, the um, uh, two uh, uprights on the edge of the bottom, on the end of the edge of the bottom board. Um, we have a, a, a slat here and a slat here. Then there's, this is number 10 hardware cloth. And uh, uh, then we have another two slats. Just, I, I screw them in. And you, you can probably see this, there's a screw there and a screw there and a screw there and a screw there. And I just screw them in and just enough to hold this in place. And there's a gap right here. So the bees will come out and they come up. They sort of are confused when you first put it on, but uh, they'll come up and they fly out there. But the robbers come in and the robbers are trying to get in through the screen. So you're, the bees in this hive know to exit and enter above the robbing screen but uh, uh, another, uh, but uh, the robbers don't. And so they can't get in. Um, the uh, other comment about these screens is that if you ever have to move a hive, they're pretty handy because you can just cut, you can cover the top up and then you can keep ventilation in, uh, uh, keep ventilation going on in the hive. And that's one thing about moving bees is that if you shut them up for too long, you can kill them because they, because of lack of ventilation. They get, they all over, they'll overheat. And this is usually a summer or fall issue, but, it, but Jennifer tells me that she has seen nukes attacked and robbed out in spring. The equipment. So this is another sort of tip. Um, and this, this one hurt me. Um, Catherine Edwards suggested this, but it definitely definitely was a problem for me as I didn't have enough equipment. You need more than you think. And so this is kind of the minimum possible list. 
uh, get two brew boxes, get two to three honey supers, get a new box. Um, the reason I say get a new box is that you may want to practice splitting, but also you may, you're, someone will find out that you have these. They'll say, oh, would you like a swarm? You say, oh yeah, what do I do with it? So you can put it in a new box and get enough frames to fill them all because you don't want to ever leave empty space in a beehive. And I will show you a picture why later. It's a box size. It's another kind of new newbie thing, a, a five frame nuke. So this is the box on the top and everyone should have one. This is an eight frame box. And I must admit that I wish that I had gone to eight frame boxes. That was a mistake that I made in the beginning, not realizing how heavy honey can be. Uh, and it is really heavy. <laughs> So a medium super full of honey, these are supers, not full deep, um, is 40 to 50 pounds in an eight frame box. But in a 10 frame box, it can go up to 60 pounds when you're, when you're lifting that and trying to carry it. And if you have a deep because you didn't have enough supers and your bees were putting on a lot of honey, then that's 80 or 90 pounds. And that is definitely backbreaking. So, so that's, so that's, just my personal wish. I'm all 10 frames right now because I've got all this stuff that's 10 frames and to switch to eight frames would be a big deal for me. But I still wish I'd gone eight frame. And hives are heavy. So this is a, a picture courtesy of uh, Sue and Phil and uh, a stand that couldn't quite take the weight. Um, a hive can easily weigh 300 pounds. Um, and uh, uh, so make sure your stand is sturdy. And here's, a, here's another picture from Phil. And this is a setup that he has. He's got these uh, concrete blocks, very practical. And uh, he's put two by fours in here. And the two by fours are running in the gaps in the, in the, in the concrete blocks. So it's a very practical um, hive stand. And he's got a work table in the rear here. It's also a very handy thing to have because you're always wanting to put things down and pick things up when you're working on these hives. Uh, Jim, yeah. uh, you might notice that one of the uh, hives is cantilevered off of the end. If you take the other hive off the other end, it might very well tip up, uh, especially if the uh, hive on the right is heavy. So it might support it on the ends, not in the middle. That's a, that's a good point. Here's how I personally do it. I just use cinder block stands and uh, they won't collapse. One thing is, I'll talk a little bit about this later, um, is that um, um, bees are alerted by vibration. And so if you're working on a hive, like, in this case, if I was working on this hive and jostling it around, the vibration would come through to this hive from the, the two by fours. So these bees are already moved up on the alert factor that something's going on. And so that might be a little more feisty when you get to them. Um, it's sort of a, a comment. So there's no vibration to alert this hive that, that something's going on. And there's space to stand on the side so where not to stand is in the front because you're standing in the flight path. Uh, standing on the side and having space on, to work on the side is, is a good thing. Here's another kind of thing which I learned the hard way, um, level your hives. And you really want a slight slope. So they're sloping to the front. And I killed, we had a really wet year, uh, maybe three, four, four years ago now, maybe. Um, um, and uh, that year I, I was away over Christmas and, and, and came back in January to have two of my hives, two of my three hives um, um, looking terrible when I looked at them in late January. And what had happened was that water had run, the hives were sloped to the back and there was 
water moated in the in the in the in the baseboard, and it had not drained out. And the bees do not like water in their hive. So both both of those hives died. Um, and if you if you don't use foundation, if you use foundation or starter, this bit's not so important. Level from side to side. But if you if you don't use foundation, um, um, and so if you're using starter, so so empty comb, so they, they can they can build in the comb, um, then uh, uh, they will build it vertically. So if you have a slight angle on your frame, they will build it straight down, and so you'll have all this comb. Not they don't know anything about the, your frame, so they just build it vertically. So. I always, and I've moved mostly to foundationless frames now. Um, but sometimes I think I should go back to foundation just because of the hassle of having mixed drone comb and, 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 and worker comb in the same frame. Um, but uh, I have mostly gone foundationless. And uh, uh, so I level. And you can shim. There's, a little, there's my, my fancy shim right there. So here's why you don't leave empty space in a hive. So last year I had a swarm um, show up uh, on my, I had a bait hive, which had, it was quite a big bait hive. It was a super and a deep. Um, um, and uh, the super, the, the deep had frames in it. Uh, it was on top. Um, and uh, the super was below and uh, the bees moved in. I thought, oh, fantastic. Um, they just flew, they just showed up one day. Um, and uh, uh, when I opened it up, like about two weeks later, this is what it looked like. <laughs> because they had actually not, they had built off the frames. So they built off the bottom of the frames in all the empty space. They completely ignored the frames and just built below them. Um, so I had to take off all that comb, uh, band it into the frames, Fix it up. It was it was just stupid. <laughs> so inspection tips. I want to talk about inspection. I don't have a lot of pictures on this. Well, I have a few, but but one thing to know is that bees basically have like the TSA. They have the terrorist alerts: yellow, orange, red. And the goal is to keep them from getting to red alert because if they get to red alert. You're going to get waves of bees coming at you. Uh, one tip is to inspect in the early afternoon uh, when the bees are a lot of the bees are away foraging. The house bees and the nurse bees they're, they're the last to get mad. Randy Oliver has taught me this parlor trick where you can tip a whole bunch of, for example, when you do um, mite inspections, you shake the you shake nurse bees and house bees into a, a plastic tub. Um, and then the foragers will fly out of that tub, leaving, leaving the house bees and the nurse bees. They're the ones you want to inspect for mites. But you can put your hand in and you can just pick those bees up. They won't sting you. Um, so they're the, one, the last to get mad. So, so they're, they're the ones which are less likely to go after you. So use light smoke. That's another tip. You don't need much smoke. Uh, a lot of smoke will really disrupt that hive. Uh, don't do jerky movements. I, I personally have pretty calm bees most of the time. And so I almost never actually use any smoke. Uh, I actually don't recommend that. Um, I just don't tend to do it. But one of the things is if I'm moving and I, I, I move like this across a hive, I'll see a wave of bees look at that. Sometimes I'll get bees flying up from the frames and then landing on my hand. And then they'll They'll say, "Did I? What? What was that about?" And they, what, then they were, often won't sting, but but uh, uh, that's how you get stung: is you have these jerky movements because they can see the speed. But if you move sort of slow and smooth, it's they're far less likely to do that. So and don't vibrate. I, I mean, vibration is kind of tough. Uh, so here's a pre-alert: don't dump stuff on top of the next side you're working on because uh, you can already get them up to that yellow yellow alert. But also just levering frames out. If you can lever them out carefully or you can open up space so you can work 
then you're not um, um, gonna jerk. You're not gonna bump that high. So one thing I do personally is I work from top to bottom and I work from one side to the other. That gives me space. And uh, the tip from top to bottom come from Jerry, I think it came from, um, which is that the, the guard bees, again, the foragers are mostly at the bottom. Um, and so you're getting to the, 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 a higher proportion of bees that are likely to uh, notice that uh, you're working on them uh, uh, last, not first. One thing is don't crush bees. And that's one thing about gloves. And the problem with gloves, especially the, the gauntlet, is it's really easy to crush bees. And they do emit alarm pheromone. And the alarm pheromone is how the bees recruit other bees that something bad is happening. Scrape stings, things, scrape stings out. And just you can smoke the area to disperse the alarm pheromone. Uh, a frame rack, a frame puller. And uh, like I say, I personally suggest no gloves. Mind you, if the bees get mad, it might be very handy to have gloves to put that hive back together. <laughs> so, so I'm not saying don't have them. So here's my minimum equipment list. So right, right here I have a smoker with a very high tech plug, um, a piece of a, a wisp of paper twisted up. When you put the plug, when you put it, when I put the plug in, the smoker goes out. This smoker almost always goes out anyway. I wish I had a bigger smoker. That's one of the problems with a small smoker is it goes out. I've got a butane torch right here. I got that butane torch from my wife because she makes jewelry. Um, I still have to give it back to her. But it really was a huge improvement in terms of being able to light the smoker. Um, here's my smoker fuel. I just use a, a egg carton cardboard. I have, a, I have a hive tool right here, this is a J-hook hive tool, which I don't think a lot of people use. A lot of people use the more traditional ones. And if you have questions about that, um, other people can answer that, but I can't because I, 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 this is the guy I use. And this is my hat with a mosquito veil that I got from REI on sale. I got a, like three or four of them for $4.50 10 years ago. Um, so that's, that's my veil. The one thing is we don't want to wear black fuzzy clothes. And actually, having been through it now, I would recommend a bee suit. I think, I think a bee suit is just so easy and convenient to just put on, to just have. Yeah, I would say that's, that's the way to go. So here's uh, some examples of what not to wear. So that's me, a wonderful shot, in my dark fuzzy tracksuit pants. And uh, I do know. How would I know not to wear those, I wonder? I have tried out working with bees in these pants and they are extremely attractive to guards or foragers who decide that they don't like me. That fuzzy, that fuzzy stuff, they just will come in and they'll sting that. And then you get a whole bunch of bees that have tried to sting it and you get a lot of alarm pheromone and then you've got a bunch more bees coming in. So this is like not, 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 not what you want. This is probably not what you want either, though I personally haven't tried this. Um, but here we have me in my usual outfit with the mosquito net and wearing light sort of smooth clothing. Um, here's some other useful equipment. Right here, we have a frame puller. This is a clamp that you can, you can, uh, the bees will actually glue. This is, this is a picture, it's from Ronnie. This might be, is that you, Ronnie, by the way? Um, um, the bees will sometimes glue these frames in place. So it's really hard, especially the first one, it's really hard to get it out. Um, and the frame puller can help get that first frame out once it's been glued in place by the propolis. Right here, we have a frame rack. And a frame rack allows you to hang uh, a frame or two on the edge of the hive where it's convenient. And then you can work in the space when you're, when you're looking through the rest of the frames. Here we have a bee suit. And notice we have one more thing. We have more anti-ant 
these are tuna cans with oil. So fairly low tech. So smoker, um, Phil Stobb provided this picture. This is a small smoker. This is a smoker more like I should have gotten. Get one, make sure you get one with a wire cage. Very important, get one with a wire cage um, because these guys get pretty hot. And uh, uh, if they brush against polyester bee, bee jackets, they'll melt. Um, one of the people suggested getting a metal bucket to put your smoker in, which I actually think is pretty sensible. Um, this guy's got a stopper, which is a, a, a little, which is an improvement over my low tech uh, uh, paper twist. Uh, this is a spirit stopper because wine corks are too big. Um, and for fuels, punk wood or it is a dried rotted, rotted tree trunk is slow, born, slow burning, it's cool and stays alight. And here's another tip, blowing smoke through a wad of grass added on the top of any fuel just cools it a lot. And uh, uh, don't use wood chips, they're too hot. Um, and another thing is that oleander smoke is poisonous. Um, oleanders are the, 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 small, the flowering trees that, or the flowering shrub, well, they're small, small trees that you on the freeways all around California. Um, but Mexican elder and many of the sumacs like poison oak, you don't want to use those. I don't know if it hurts the bees any, but, uh, but uh, uh, it can hurt you. <laughs> so here's my mite monitoring equipment. I just wanted to put that, I wanted to put a picture in. I carry this, this is a rubber tub that I have for mite monitoring. I'm not going to talk about how you do mite monitoring. I'm just going to say this is what I have. So I've got another of these, uh, these uh, quart mason jars. This has got a lid and I, I cut some of that same hardware cloth that we use to make um, the rubbing screens into a circle and just glued it into the top of the, the, the lid, the screw on part of the lid. And, and so you put the bees in here and you, with powdered sugar, a teaspoon, a couple of teaspoons of powdered sugar, you shake them uh, into the tub and uh, uh, the number of bees you want is a half cup measure. Um, and then I shake them in, I, I shake them into a bowl a white bowl with water. And then I, the mites will float at the top and they're easy to count. Um, and then I also, in the spring, like right now, I actually don't, I, I might monitor with drone comb sampling and I use a capping fork for that. And that's something you can read up on too. But that's, so this is the equipment I carry around with me uh, when I inspect my hives. That and this, and that's it. That's, that's all my inspection equipment. So I wanted to touch on sort of uh, one more topic, which is moving the hive. And the reason that I touch on this topic is because the first year I kept bees, I found out they were in the wrong place. Um, they were in the shade and they were in a location where the flight path interfered uh, with uh, uh, people traffic. And so the thing about, they say you can move them three feet or three miles, but nothing in between. But I, I don't think that's true. You can move them any distance in your yard. So if I was going to move this hive, I would, I would move it in sections late in the day. So I put up a bottom board first, and then I just move the sections one by one, because to move it all in one go, it's pretty heavy. But to move it section by section is not too bad. You're not going to have too many bees that are left out. And if you look at this hive, I put this, this is foliage bro blocking the entrance. So you block it after you do the move, you just block them up for a day, again, with a robbing screen or something. So you don't, you want to keep ventilation um, um, or a piece of, you know, you could use uh, just any old screen, but but you, you do have to keep that ventilation. Um, then when you open that up, you put this uh, 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 branch in front of it, foliage, and then the bees, instead, the bees will try and come pouring out and the foragers have reoriented to the old location, they will stop 
when they realize that this isn't your, their normal entrance and they'll climb through this foliage and then many of them, but not all of them, will reorient. Um, one thing that uh, uh, I found was that you get like a, a slew of bees, sort of they'll fly to the old location then they'll fly in circles and then they'll fly to the new location. But sometimes if you, if you had to, if your moving time wasn't great, um, quite a few of the bees may not have been involved in the move. And then I'll put like a nuke box in the old location to collect the confused bees. And then every night I'll just move it back and put the entrance facing the, the entrance of the new hive, of the new location of the hive. And that, uh, uh, well, it makes me feel good anyway. I don't know how effective it is, but it makes me feel good. Uh, and so here's another uh, uh, thing that I've done in my backyard. This is the same hive actually. I have a screen here. So here's a picture of the screen close up. And the reason I did this is that my wife, after all these years of um, keeping bees, uh, got stung recently and she had what they call a large local reaction. And it's actually pretty, it's not anaphylactic shock, but, you, but her whole arm swelled up. Um, she ended up with like a weeping so area the size of a palm of a hand where the sting was um, because of the pressure. Um, and took a good solid week or 10 days to go away. And, and uh, uh, one of the comments was there's these tablets. They're basically anti-inflammatories that you want to take. So if, you, if this happens to you, just talk to a doc. Um, but I put a screen up to force the bees flight path up and away. And so what the bees do, they can see this no problem. Uh, when I first put it up, the bees, the returning bees will come down and they'll hover trying to figure out how to get through this screen, even though it's so, so light, but now they're starting to just move up so that they're, and, and so they're not, they're not, uh, they're not flying out and being quite so aggressive. Um, actually, these bees are not that aggressive right now anyway, being spring. So if you do decide to move a whole hive, this is a something that I would say, uh, uh, use a ratcheting strap and a dolly for big hives. You want to make sure the front entrance is closed, otherwise they'll come out. Use a, use, here's another example of a uh, robbing screen, but you can just block the top of the robbing screen and that will uh, 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 allow them to ventilate if it's hot. And here's an example of someone who's about to have some interesting times. Notice, notice this top and this base. Um, if this moves a little bit more, this they will have a lot of bees escape. So I want to talk last about some resources. Um, ask questions on the, the, the ACBA B talk, the Google group. There's actually a lot of activity on that on that um, uh, chat group. Uh, lots of questions can be asked and answered. Uh, attend que meetings, ask more questions. Um, see if you can get a mentor or, or even if it's just get, you know, some temporary help from a, 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 a more experienced beekeeper. Ask, ask. Biofuel Oasis runs lots of classes. There may be more classes that I know, don't know about, but certainly Biofuel Oasis in my area run a lot of classes. Uh, the club has a library and other resources. Um, here are some good people, um, and you can just Google these, Ian Stepler, Michael Bush, uh, Sung Lee in Haywood or Castro Valley, uh, and Randy, Randy Oliver. These are all, some of these are like hard going for beginners, but they're worth trying to understand what's going on. Use this year to learn is, is my advice. Um, and so I'll, I'll quit here, um, but uh, if you have questions, please ask. And we have time to have a question and answer right now as well. If anyone's got comments or if anyone wants to suggest uh, uh, stuff that I should have said and didn't, please do. I have a question. Um, oh, okay. So, so we're trying to we're trying to come up with something to put our hives and nukes on in our backyard so that. Um, you know, 
we we don't put them on tables and stuff, right? So we put them on the ground. We, you know. Mm. Ask you again. If I think the question might have been, I'm not sure what the question was. He wants to know what kind of hive stands people are using. Ah, so you, yeah, you saw several hive stands in the pictures, right? Yeah. Um, one thing is don't put them high. Don't have your hives high because if you have your hives high and you end up stacking up a bunch of boxes on them, then it's really hard <clears> to, <throat> to get to that top box. You don't have the, it, it's, it's, you don't have the leverage. Your back doesn't have the leverage. So, so I okay. say keep them low. That's one tip, but I, I didn't hear the, enough of your question and the rest of it. Okay, is it just because I'm the the Wi-Fi is not working right very well? I could try one more time, and if it doesn't work, we'll just stop. But anyway, that um, so we're we're thinking we're going to put like basically we what we have now is is stands on top of stone kind of thing, little stands, but they just feel really tippy, like you could knock them over really easily. And they're these metal little stands that you buy. We bought them from Man Lake, I think. And then we also have nukes sitting on tables, which we're not too fond of out there. And so what we would want, what we're thinking we're going to do is basically put two four by fours, you know, just wide enough and running in parallel that are really long. And we would just put them across on uh, perpendicular to that. Um, yeah. And then, and then we would like, use concrete to make sure that they're steady. And then of course we do something so it could, you know, the water situation. So it would be a little bit inclined down. Is there something different you would do than that? Or is that, or even is that just a terrible way to do it or? Well, that, that's, I, let's see, I had one of the pics there. Let me just share my screen again. I'll just bring up, I think you're describing a pic that looks very like one of Phil's setups. Okay. Um, and there it is. So, so I have a related question to that. If you have those cinder blocks like that, how do you defend against ants? Because there's no uh, legs to put your oil traps in with the moats. Yes, like that. Those pictures. How do you? Defend yeah, that that kind of thing. Yeah. So you could you can definitely do moats with this guy because you could put the if depending on your moat size. So if you have the little moats like I was showing earlier. Then you can put those. You can put those in. Where are my moats? See, these guys are quite small, so you could put those in a situation like that. But 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 for a situation like this, or you know, and stands and stands like this, then then that wouldn't work, right? I mean, I, I've got to tell you, I personally have had only probably a handful of hives in 10 years. I mean, I don't keep many hives. I keep like three or four, but I've only had a handful to come to ants. Um, and it, it's, it's all been like nukes or hives which got sick and I didn't deal with it and, and they dwindled. Um, so that's why I don't tend to worry about it so much. You've just, but you just, you do have to keep your hive strong and healthy and it's a recommendation for the new guys because the nukes that you get um, may be weaker. I mean, I just set up, I just picked up a swarm uh, on Sunday um, and I'm not <coughs> doing any ant protection for that. So going back to the, the, the question, so the one you showed the picture of that, you said Phil did it this way. Um, do you see any issues with doing it that way that we should be concerned about and also, um, uh, yeah, I yeah. There's one. There's one clear issue, which is you take this hive off, this guy, guy might tip down. Okay, so you got to make sure that independent. You know, if, even if you put one on the far side, it's not going to cause that to happen if it was by yeah, itself. It. Yeah, you can see the point. Pivot. That's something I haven't thought about. Okay, so we don't want it to be a, a seesaw or whatever. Um, Okay. Now, Phil, Phil may, Phil may have, I don't, Phil's not on, unfortunately, but he may have got some other device in here that prevents that. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised, but I don't. So, I don't so one of the things that's in between, um, those are two by fours. I helped him build this hive stand. 
um, and he's um, put in two bricks to sort of fill up that whole space next to the two by four. Um, so the two by fours aren't loosey goosey in those holes. There, there's bricks in there with them to tighten up the space in that hole. Does that make sense? Okay, that that makes sense. That's good to know. Yeah. Okay. And, and then, and then, just one more question with that: Is there like a kit that you can buy that's already made that just does this, and it's that you guys can think of that? Yeah. Yeah. You can buy. There's a. There are stands you can buy online, which are which are like um, uh, which look a lot like. Let's see. Where was it? I want to see that ant. The metal. The metal stands. We have those. If that's what you're like yeah, yeah, we have those ones, and we're just we're just concerned it's going to tip over. Okay, so no no one's aware of like you, there's the you know you can just have the two. I I know we can build it, but the the two by four, the four by fours set up already that you just buy and it's already done. Nobody knows about that. Doesn't if you exist. if you Google, um, I built a hive stand out of um, three quarter inch galvanized pipe and flanges um, and and then the pressure treated uh, two by four or four by fours. If you Google that um, three quarter inch um, uh, galvanized pipe and flange hive stand, there's a great yeah. YouTube on do it yourself building. And you can submerge those galvanized flanges and pipes in a can of water, oil or whatever. Okay. Thank you. This is all I had about that. I really appreciate you both, both of you answering my questions. Thank you. I have a couple comments. Um, I used a an old hot water heater stand just because it was available at the time, and it works great. It's about eighteen inches off the ground, and it can handle hundreds of pounds of weight. Um, and uh, speaking of the height off the ground, uh, there's a guy that I like to watch on Fridays that does YouTube videos for beginners back in Pennsylvania. And he commented, he actually had video of a uh, nighttime video of, of um, raccoons and, and uh, skunks visiting his hives and eating bees. And um, he suggests 16 to 18 inches off the ground so that when they have to stand up to reach the bees, they expose their belly and they get stung and they don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah I've heard about that too, the skunk thing. That'll be another problem that if we do the other way, then we got we could potentially have skunk. So yeah. the thing to combat that is um, you can put the carpet strip stuff, the little nails um, that they tack carpet down to the floor, to the edges. If you put a few pieces of that on a piece of scrap uh, plywood so that and you just put that right below the entrance. Um, they don't want to step on that stuff and mess with the entrance. Yeah, that was a great tip that I got, which I didn't include. Um, um, not ever having had any skunk or raccoon problems, even though I've got plenty of raccoons. Uh, I have a question. Um, I did uh, an inspection about a month ago and uh, I had a large mite count, 60. And so I treated initially with one mite away quick strip and I was speaking to Kelsey at Biofuel and he suggests, and, and it reduced to 20. And he suggested that I just hit them with two. Now, since that time, I think I've lost, uh, I've lost my queen. I did an inspection a few days back. The hive at that stage was thriving. I did an inspection a few days back. So it's been sort of three weeks um, since the previous inspection. And I'm down to only half of one frame of brood. I can't see any eggs. There were some super seed cells there. I've never seen the queen. I've, I've never seen a queen. Um, but um, previously I'd had quite a lot of brood and I'm worried that I've lost my queen and I don't know whether I've got a new queen, but obviously something has happened in the last week. Um, do you think it could be 
a new superseded queen, a new virgin queen, and therefore the brood that's there is from the new queen. Um, mm. What do I do next? Like uh, I don't, I previously have had quite a lot of brood. Cap brood or open? Open, not much capped at all. There's a bit of capped, but not much. Oh, so it sounds like it sounds like uh, your queen did supersede, and your new queen has started laying. It was three weeks? Well, three weeks isn't quite. No, uh, maybe three weeks would be enough for that. So when should I inspect again, and and what should I uh, what should I see, and if not, what should I do? So you, th these bees are probably fairly. Uh, probably have a low mite count at this, or much lower mite count. Yeah, you, I did test the mites last time because I think they wouldn't have any. The mite, the mite away was very effective. From 60 yeah. to 20, I'm expecting maybe well, I'll I gotta, I got to I got to tell you, I got to tell you, 20, 20 is a huge number. I would, I would, have, I would have had a heart attack <laughs> if I had 20. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to uh, make a comment. Um, yeah. Uh, I suspect if this just happened, you're high swarms. Okay. And, and so you probably have a new queen who may, did you say you have larva? Yes, I have larva. I didn't see eggs. I have larva, but I've only got one frame and it's probably 60% of that has larva, uh, has um, say 30% uncapped 30 percent capped and that's it no other frames um do they have you have small larvae really tiny ones uh not super super small that i saw um i would say medium okay it's possible that your hive swarm yes and has a new queen and um she hasn't started laying yet and when was the last time you were uh, inspected the hive? Only uh, a couple of days ago. So it was on the 10th. And before that? Uh, it was a month before that. So that was after the treatment. The previous one was the 7th of March. And at that time, I treated with double mite away quick strips. And I did have quite a lot of death of um, bees after that. Yeah, um, I would wait another week and yes. uh, and check again to, for eggs. Um, but my guess is you have a new queen, and you will be seeding brood ag again at some point. Yeah, the, the timing the timing matches that. Okay. So you and had a swarm. Anything? You'll be swarmed. And then okay. another, and then another point in terms of uh, mites. If you are, your hive has swarmed, and you have a brood break, uh, that will probably take care of the rest of the mites for a while. You, I don't think you need to treat again for until maybe uh, July or some sometime like that. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate that. One other possibility, I'm not, I, I'm unclear about the, whether there's really larva there now, currently fresh larva, but you may well, have knocked out, may have knocked out your queen with formic acid. Yes, that's what I think. Because yeah, there, was quite that, a lot of, there was quite a lot of bee death after that second treatment with the um, mitoways. Yeah, and they get, they get confused, tend to attack the queen sometimes. So queen loss by formic is a pretty common experience. So it's just a question of whether whether they were able to recover a new queen by making one or whether you're still queenless. And if I'm still queen queenless, do I need to get one in a hurry? Yes. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. So you don't lose so so you maintain some nurse bees that can generate royal jelly because without if you go too long without royal jelly, then there's nobody to raise the new bees. So you had con continuity is very important. Hey, hey, and Robert. if it's been too long, you may want to borrow a frame of brood from somebody else of 
of uh, sealed brood so that you have nurse bees very quickly. We also want, I want them to convert to a laying worker too, so you need brood, brooder queen, keep your brood. It's lost all their bees, and I, and I think they lost them for mites because they weren't treating. But so there's nobody around, around here. I'm in uh, North Berkeley, nobody around here I know has spare brood because they've lost, they've all lost their bees and they're using their brood for um, new hives. But if you have open larva, the only ways you're going to have that is either you have a queen or you have laying workers. That's it. So okay. if they're large larva, they're, they're probably past three to or maybe five days. Three more days, they'll be capped. And you can look at the cappings. If they're flat, those are workers. And if okay. they're not flat, if they're don't, and you have a lay, you probably have a laying worker producing, you know, laying unfertilized eggs, which turn into drones. If you've got those larvae, they and they uh, uh, are flat. You have a new queen somewhere in the hive. Sorry, I'm just, I've just lost it. The question it. is, do you have enough bees to take care of the new I've brood? Got bees. And the I've got young, and the, you know, you should start to see more larvae. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about, excuse me, if one of the things that they talk about with uh, Mind Away Quick Strips and Formic Pro is to check your hive for evidence of a queen a month after treatment. Uh, that, that gives you, uh, either a new queen or, you know, the absence of a queen, and then you have to do something about that. Thanks so much, folks. So, th so this is Robert. You know, I've, I've got hives in North Berkeley. You can get my information from one of the other people, and if you need some brood, I'd be happy to help you out. Okay, thanks so much, Robert. Glad, glad to. Here, here's a quick, just a quick picture of, of a problem. <laughs> Uh, lay worker or drone layer, but you see all the drone comb in there. That's that, that's what can happen if they're if they're left queenless too long without brood or a queen. Okay, it wasn't raised like that. It was um, flat. Okay, good. You're queen. You're queen, right? Then I think. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? Comments, statements, anything? <laughs> That's a great talk, Jim. Yeah, great job, Jim. I definitely appreciate it. That was uh, very informative. Thank you. Hi, uh, Hi uh, this is Greg. I had a question about treating your yard for mites. Is that a thing? Is that something I could do? I don't have my nuke yet. No, it's coming at the end of the month. No, is there like some? You don't know of any treatments that are it's, it's okay. Like, for it's like it's like treating it's like treating your house for light for uh, head lice or. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, All right, it's, thank you. It's not a thing. It's 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 that it, they they live on the bees. Yeah. So yeah, don't you, you, until you get a hive, you don't have to worry about uh, don't worry about broa. But once you get once you get a hive, then then it becomes an issue. Any, uh, yeah, um, any other comments or, or questions? Yeah, um, earlier in the presentation, you were talking about moving the hives and um, uh, a friend of mine I visited, he had a number of hives and he was explaining to me how he rotated one of his hives 90 degrees and it confused the heck out of his bees. And uh, I, I just had a really hard time believing that, right? And I hear these stories about moving your hives and how you've got to do it just right Otherwise, the bees get really super confused. So I noticed that when I approach my hive, the bees tend to go to the left when they leave the hive. There's far denser bees on the left than on the right. So, and, and it turns out my entrance reducer is on the left side. So as an experiment, when I did my last Mitoway quick strip thing, when I put the, queen ex the, the entrance reducer back in, 
I turned it around so that it was on the other side. So the opening only moved about five inches, right? And it confused the bees. <laughs> They'd come back to the hive and they would walk back and forth and back and forth on the landing board like six or eight times before they'd find the entrance. So, so the next time I got out there and messed with it, I put it back and they seem to be much happier about that. So now I'm convinced they, they do confuse easily. If you move your hive, you gotta be really careful how you do it or you're gonna confuse the heck out of your bees. Yeah, I mean, what they will do is they will, <clears throat> if you move a hive and you don't, you know, you just move it, um, then they'll go back to where the hive was. Um, and uh, they will, they've got a very keen sense of smell. And so they'll start to circle around looking for a, another home and they will they will end up probably in a in another hive if you've got more than one hive or they may find that same hive or they may not but but uh uh i i the 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 technique that i gave which is move a hive and then block them up and then put a bush in front or put foliage in front is a is a not it's not that's my technique it's 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 one which is widely available uh, and proven on the on by many other beekeepers backyard beekeepers. I mean, yeah. commercials don't care. <laughs> the other thing you can do is um, like Sister Barbara caught a swarm and she wanted to relocate it to another part of her yard. Um, and so she asked me, she's down in Fremont, she asked me to take the hive to Oakland to five day, for five days or seven days. And then I'm going to bring it back and we're going to put it where she wants it. So if you have friends. They reorientate can, twice. What's that? So they reorientate twice. Yes, they do. They'll, they'll reorient every time. I, I move hives all over the the area and you know multiple times so they're they'll reorient it every time you move them as long as you move them far enough away yeah yeah i mean i mean one thing is your your, your hive if you're going to do this do this in the late summer or or do it in the do it in the summer when the honey flow is not on otherwise you've just lost a week of uh, honey production which is right now is the is the is the peak time if you have that luxury well uh, you know you if, if you get to know club members right somebody will take your hive for a week i mean what's the you know yes i've had a lot of success with just uh i have a fallow um raised raised bed on the ground the grass grows up through so i have all this long grass about you know, eight, eight inches long. And I just rip that, rip, rip, rip. And I take one of the uh, old uh, um, <laughs> recycling bins that they used to use, a little box style, flip it upside down and pile, just piles of grass on top of that in front of the entrance. And I also put a um, robbing screen on to confuse them. So a robbing screen and a pile of grass, and uh, within a few days, they're all happy, and nobody's going back to their old location. I'll move them from my front yard to the backyard, from you know any any distance, uh, and, you know. But that that just means I'm not growing vegetables <laughs> in the raised bed. But I like right, I, I do like your idea about using an, uh, a, another club member's yard to move it to. That's a great idea. When bees are uh, orienting, they're picking up on all the landmarks uh, around the hive and the hive itself and the adjacent hives, uh, and they use that to navigate. And they'll fly right into the entrance if they've got it all nailed down. One other thing though, is if you're inclined to put your six or seven or eight hives in a row, don't do that unless you have some distinctive landmarks because uh, the hives on the end will accumulate the bees that can't find their way 
into the hives in the middle because bees cannot count that high. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the meeting down but leave the Zoom open. So we'll officially close the meeting so we can probably turn off the recording.